13, the, my, the cool kids at my high school, I was at Westerford, um, were going to a filmmaker's workshop and I wanted to be pals with them. Anyway, so I went along to the filmmaker's workshop and was instantly hooked. Uh, we shot little shorts on Super 8 uh, with John Hill, who's still active as a teacher of film in Cape Town. And uh, it had never occurred to me that this was a job. You know, there was not something that friends of my parents did when I was growing up in the 70s. So, uh, so once I realized, oh, I could be a film director, how cool is that? Then that was always what I wanted to do. Um, I think documentary and features complement each other, and I hope to continue to work in both arenas. The process is very different, um, but what you are always doing is trying to find the story. And I think the, for me, what's challenging and, uh, and nourishing away, in a way about the discipline of being a director is that in order to do it well, one, one has to be completely present and open to what is happening in front of you. And I think that's true whether you're walking into a real life situation with a camera as a documentarian, or whether you're a narrative director on a set with, with ideas about what you want from a scene but perhaps getting something different from your actors. So in a way, I think there's, you know, there are similar parts of uh, muscles, if you like, creative muscles, um, but it's, it's something quite particular to create a, a reality and then film it versus going out into the world with a camera, um, which is, let's face it, easier. Uh, the, the Cannes short film corner thing was uh, a total surprise. I actually put the film in because it was a way to get a, a, an accreditation badge to attend <laughs> really cheaply or for free I think and then suddenly won a camera and a computer which I still have which was amazing um, and it was a short film about nuclear and that the, the, the short that we did was very much it was kind of Bush bashing you know uh, President Bush at that time and I think we just we hit a nerve you know people were ready to see Bush taken down uh, and I got lucky um, Festivals are important. I mean, I think the thing when you make a, a small, uh, low budget or indie, for want of a better word, film is we don't have a lot of money for publicity. And so what the festivals do is they provide a platform and a built-in publicity framework. Um, and I think even if your, uh, your primary means of distribution ends up being uh, an online video on demand you know, route, people need to know about the film in order to look for it. Um, and I'm looking forward in the coming years to seeing more um, channels, I suppose you'd call them, or uh, sites created so that the audience has some guidance about, oh, if I go to Indiegogo, I will find these kinds of films. If I go, you know, because Netflix at the moment is really dominant in that arena, we don't have it access here yet. Um, I'm really hoping with, with our film Cold Harbor that, uh, that we'll make a splash in the cinemas locally. Um, we'll know more about that in the next 10 days. I'll talk about the poachers first. The first person I spoke to, I won't name names at all, and the first person I spoke to uh, was someone who actually was an, an activist, or is an activist for artisanal fishers and for their rights. And this is many years ago, and I told him what I wanted to do, and, uh, and he said, you're going to get yourself in trouble, I think. <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, but he was incredibly helpful and, uh, and let me look at some footage for a documentary that wasn't actually released here. It was a French made documentary that was very useful research. And then later on down the line, as I would speak to people about different things, you know, I was talking to them about locations or about something else, people said, Yeah, I know someone. <laughs> you know, and everyone I spoke to was always an ex poacher, whether that they were or were not ex, or anyway, they were always ex poachers. Um, and that first person, you know, commentary was, was really the most useful in terms of like, because when you're writing a scene, you need to know, okay, how do you do? Do you take them out of the shells under the water or on the beach? Or how do you carry them? Or where do you freeze them? Or how many days do you have before they have to be sold? And those kinds of things. Um, on the law enforcement side, um, there is uh, a police, uh, very senior policeman, I think. Now he's a colonel. Um, at the time I spoke to him, he was an inspector Veery. I think now he's Colonel Veery or Superintendent Veery in the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. Extremely interesting man who was in MK Intelligence in exile. Um, and he was incredibly helpful about how the police attack the and, and 
what had happened, what had been happened, this is a few years ago now, was that South African police were actually going to Hong Kong to train with law enforcement there to better understand the Chinese gangs and to be able to identify the chops, which are their stamps, you know, identifying stamps, um, and just the challenges they're facing. In terms of the casting process, it was a combination. Uh, I wrote the lead role for Tony Kuroche. Uh, I had seen him in Carlo Matabane's film, Conversations on a Sunday Afternoon. And I was like, that's the guy. Uh, that is my sexy, cool, and dangerous action hero. We don't have that guy in South African cinema yet. And so I wrote it for him in, with him in mind, not knowing if he would do it. And, and happily, uh, ultimately, he agreed to do it. Um, Fana McQuenna was someone whose work I didn't know, and it was suggested by our casting director, Mooney Lee, um, who is extraordinarily creative, rigorous, uh, just an amazing person to collaborate with. Um, uh, Dion Lotz was someone who was suggested by uh, my producer, Tendeka Matatu, and I'd originally written that character, the, the, the police um, antagonist, if you like, um, frenemy, he's kind of a frenemy, um, as a, to be a, a, a so-called coloured character, uh, because it's the Western Cape, and also because I was a little bit leery of having a, a white policeman doing bad stuff. Um, but then once, you know, when I saw Dion in Schoonhead, I just, he's such a good actor. I was just like, okay, well, I'll rewrite it for him. Uh, so I did that. Similarly, Thomas Gumede, um, you know, playing the rookie cop, I had conceived of the character as a, a large, fat guy with a bit of sugar addiction. And, uh, and Thomas is bantam weight, you know, funny, sharp, a to something totally different. Um, but he really wanted to do it, and I think he's very talented. So again, I just reshaped the, the script for the cast. And I think, I mean, in a lot, in the kind of general frame, I feel like actors are the director's greatest resource. And as a white South African, I had some qualms about can I write these black characters? And I think we, I think we sort of censor ourselves and we limit ourselves. And maybe it's my generation having come up in apartheid that we have all those. You know, I'm not mandated to speak for, you know? Um, but actually, as a filmmaker, what, what has liberated me is this, this, this sense that I'm going to cast someone who, yeah, he might not have the same experience as the character, but he's a man, he's, he, he's about the same age. You know, in, in the case of uh, Tony Kuroche and Fana McQuenna, they were both in the struggle um, together, they were comrades on the run together. So they know things about that experience that I don't as a writer, and they bring that to their performance. People were, I mean, everywhere where we actually filmed, people were incredibly cooperative. Um, we certainly explored filming in other places <laughs> and found that people were less cooperative. But I mean, I think, um, you know, we did some work in Ocean View and, you know, really used real people as extras, real boats, you know. I, I got there on the day, I was like, the boat's called Bubble Us. What a gift. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the, our, our city is extraordinary. Uh, so I think, you know, things, things emerge that you can't have possibly imagined. We did a lot of the township filming in Langa. Um, I worked with a locations person called Gladstone Marley, more than a locations person, he's really a, a, you know, a producer. And uh, he had worked on Safe House. And so I think they had had a positive experience on Safe House doing a lot of shooting in Langa. And so we knew that London was film friendly and that people kind of had a sense of how it was going to work. So year one in particular, we had a night shoot at Lunga Old Flats. Old apartheid, uh, you know, tenement style housing, really run down, very poor neighborhood. I was nervous about it, it was going to be a night shoot, we had to do a fight, uh, you know, shit can go wrong, really, right? And uh, the, the person responsible for managing the location, in this case, uh, uh, Luisa Ponongo, went into the community, recruited local people from the, from the neighborhood association to, to help with our security. And so on the day, we were in a collaboration with people from the neighborhood, and that made all the difference. And they were, they were great. They were really interested and supportive, and uh, we, had a, we had a great time. I think that the, the South African films that are getting the most traction at international festivals are what we would call art house films. And personally, that frustrates me a little. I feel like people, 
the, you know, within the festival programming arena, there's this idea that African films have to be art house films. I very consciously have made an African film that is not an art house film, it's a genre or maybe on a good day you could call it auteur genre or socially conscious genre or smart house. Um, but I think if, if, if there is in, in your aesthetic a tendency or an inclination towards art house, go at that 150% and you're more likely to get your work out there in the festivals anyway. Indeed, I'm, I'm writing furiously. Uh, I'm working on another thriller, uh, this time about white collar crime and human trafficking. Uh, and uh, I've also been in a long gestation on a project about Maria Makeba, which is slowly taking shape and we hope uh, that will find its way to screens in the next couple of years. I've never seen you here before. Undercover. It's cut. Cuban stuff. We had 17 dead Chinese last year. Turf war. Try it. Sees where Mia wants to make detective. And in time he will. But there's a risk that he may be tempted. When you deal with organized crime, there's all kinds of money. What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Victim by two zena must forget. Bodies are warning. Find the Chinese boy. You could help me. If you keep me informed, your investigation will go more quickly. Everyone has a price. So how much did they give you? What makes you think that I'll take a bribe? No, it's cool. I just assumed that... You assumed were... wrong. You guys come from China every three months. I'm here to buy Perlamun. $400 a kilo in Hong Kong. Now they trade meth for Babylon. If I'm honest, in the silence of the night, I feel you betray. Joe. You change sides, Joe. You work bloody hard day and night. You're barely making a living. Integrity is a luxury few can afford. I don't take loyalty for granted. I need people I can trust. <laughs> Everyone's got a past, including you.